Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding VLF. In this presentation, we'll provide a short technical introduction to the propagation and characteristics of very low frequency signals, and how these signals are used for communications. VLF refers to signals in the frequency range of 3 to 30 kilohertz, which corresponds to wavelengths in the range of 10 to 100 kilometers. Note, however, that in practical applications, VLF is rarely used below 10 kHz. VLF is primarily used for communications, but was also previously used in navigation systems, such as the American Omega system. And until the early 1970s, the United States used VLF signals to broadcast time and frequency information. However, in modern times, the most common application of VLF is communication with submarines, since VLF can provide very stable and reliable communications, even through saltwater. Other, less common applications of VLF include so-called through-the-earth communications, which can be used for emergency communications with underground or mine workers. VLF also can be helpful in the prediction and detection of earthquakes and the resulting tsunami. In addition, researchers are also using VLF to investigate both meteorological and ionospheric phenomena. Like many other types of lower frequency signals, VLF can propagate either by surface wave, also commonly called ground wave, or by sky wave. Let's spend a few minutes taking a closer look at both of these propagation modes, starting with surface wave. The very long wavelengths at VLF allow signals at these frequencies to travel along terrain and follow the curvature of the Earth. Typically, surface or ground wave propagation at VLF has a maximum distance of a few hundred kilometers. One advantage of surface wave is that propagation conditions are generally very stable or constant. This is because the largest factor influencing surface wave propagation is the conductivity of the surface itself. And for a given path, this is essentially constant over time for both land and water. Note that obstacles with sizes that are a substantial fraction of the signal wavelength can, however, affect signal strength. At VLF, these types of obstacles would include mountains, seashores, and other large geographical or topological features. VLF skywave propagation involves the ionosphere, which is a layer of charged particles above the upper regions of the Earth's atmosphere. The ionosphere is divided into layers, and the lowest of these, the D layer, can reflect VLF signals back towards the Earth. The result is a concentric spherical waveguide made up of the bottom of the D layer and the surface of the Earth, and this is often referred to as the Earth ionosphere waveguide. VLF signals can propagate via skywave for distances of up to 20,000 kilometers, and they experience relatively low loss. Attenuation is approximately 2 to 3 dB per thousand kilometers. Because the lower layer of the ionosphere has less variation than the upper layers, there is much less fading at VLF compared to other ionospheric communications, such as the more common HF skywave propagation. That said, VLF skywave propagation is, however, affected by so-called space weather. Solar flares, coronal mass ejections, etc., affect all layers of the ionosphere, including the D-layer, and in general attenuation of VLF signals increases with increasing solar activity. In addition to space weather, latitude also has an effect on VLF propagation, since solar illumination is partly a function of how far north or south a location is. Latitude-dependent magnetic field variations can also influence VLF propagation. And although surface conductivity and topology primarily affect surface wave propagation, these factors can also impact VLF skywave propagation, since the ground is the bottom edge, so to speak, of the Earth ionospheric waveguide. But the two greatest sources of variation in VLF propagation come from spherics and diurnal effects. Let's next take a brief look at each of these and how they affect VLF propagation. The word spheric stands for atmospheric noise. Most noise at VLF is not man-made, 
but rather is created by natural background processes, primarily lightning discharges. Lightning occurs continuously around the globe and has energy levels that are far higher than any man-made signal. From a spectral point of view, lightning discharges also have more energy at lower frequencies, such as VLF, compared to higher frequencies. This noise is also impulsive in nature, and not Gaussian distributed like most other forms of naturally occurring noise. Noise at VLF propagates the same way as signals at VLF, and thus can affect receivers even when they are quite far from the noise source. And because spheric noise levels can be quite high, VLF communications often require relatively high transmit power to achieve an acceptable signal-to-noise ratio. Diurnal effects refers to the fact that attenuation of VLF signals is greater during the daytime than at night. Since noise can propagate over great distances at VLF, this higher daytime attenuation means that noise at VLF is generally lower during the daytime. Another diurnal effect involves sudden changes in signal strength when signals cross the so-called diurnal boundary. This is the line or region between night and day. Changes in signal strength are due to changes in the dielectric properties and dimensions of the waveguide. Crossing the diurnal boundary can cause attenuation to change by up to 10 to 20 dB. Note that the day-to-night transition change tends to be more gradual than the night-to-day transition. Now let's move on to antennas. Recall that VLF wavelengths are on the order of 10 to 100 kilometers, and this means that VLF antennas are always electrically short. That is, they have a length that's shorter than one wavelength. Most VLF communications antennas are implemented as vertical monopoles, and a capacitive top hat configuration is commonly used to improve both efficiency and bandwidth. This arrangement does, however, require a good ground plane, something we'll cover in more detail in just a few moments. These large, but still electrically short antennas, require a tuning or matching system that can handle both low radiation resistance as well as very high transmit power. And as we'll see later in this presentation, VLF transmitting antennas are usually much larger than receiving antennas. As we just discussed, VLF antennas tend to be quite large and thus require very large transmit sites. One potential sighting issue is that low ground conductivity can reduce antenna system efficiency and thus most VLF sites incorporate a rather extensive ground plane system consisting of wire grids and or radials. Another way of obtaining the necessary ground conductivity is to place VLF transmit sites near salt water, since salt water has very high conductivity. This higher conductivity adjacent to the wired ground plane can help to reduce losses and can reduce the overall size of the man-made ground plane needed for efficient operation at VLF. A good example of a VLF transmit site is one operated by the United States Navy near Cutler, Maine. This site was completed in 1961 and is located on a saltwater peninsula in the Gulf of Maine. The site has two arrays, each with six identical top hat style antenna panels in a star configuration, and each occupying an area of approximately 2.5 square kilometers. These antennas are both connected to a single tuning point. The system can be operated with an output power of over 1 megawatt, making it one of the most powerful transmitters in the world. This site also possesses a very elaborate ground system that's composed of thousands of kilometers of buried radials. High transmit powers generally require a very efficient antenna, but highly efficient antennas also usually have very low bandwidth. In the case of VLF transmitter systems, such as the one we just looked at, the bandwidth is typically in the range of 50 to 500 Hz, and this is much too narrow for the transmission of analog voice. Early VLF communication systems, therefore, initially used telegraphy, or Morse code, for sending messages, but later moved to digital data transmissions using FSK, or frequency shift keying, at bit rates of 50 to 75 bits per second. A more recent improvement was the use of minimum shift keying, or MSK. Similar to FSK, 
MSK also shifts the carrier between two tones. But the shift only occurs when the two sine waves are in phase, or have the same zero crossing. This provides a smoother transition and enables these systems to transmit data at bit rates of hundreds of bits per second. As mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the most common application of VLF data transmission is communicating with submarines. Ballistic missile submarines stay submerged for long periods of time to avoid detection or tracking, but during this time they must also be able to receive communications. VLF is well suited for communicating with submarines since VLF signals can penetrate salt water to a depth of tens of meters. The maximum depth depends on frequency, water temperature, and salinity. The submarine antenna can be either a floating long wire antenna, or it can be attached to a buoy or a float when the submarine is more deeply submerged. Upon receiving a VLF signal, the submarine can then rise to periscope depth and use other, higher frequencies to establish communications if necessary. Large fixed VLF transmit sites used to communicate with submarines have very high power and optimized sighting, but are also easily targetable. Therefore, the United States military has implemented an airborne VLF communication system called TACAMO, or Take Charge and Move Out, in order to ensure communication during wartime and enhance nuclear explosion survivability. This program has been in operation since the early 1960s and has gone through multiple generations and aircraft types. The first generation of TACAMO acted primarily as a signal relay, but modern TACAMO aircraft have a battle staff on board, which can, if necessary, directly communicate launch codes to both submarines and land-based sites when ordered through a three-tier command and control system. TACAMO aircraft use a special dual trailing wire antenna to transmit VLF signals while airborne. This antenna consists of a short wire trailing antenna that's released from the aircraft's tail cone and a long trailing wire antenna which is released from the rear cabin floor. Note that both of these wire antennas, including the short antenna, are in fact thousands of meters long. The combination of these two wires effectively results in a dipole type antenna. For optimal performance at VLF, the polarization of the long trailing wire antenna should be vertical, but as one can imagine, it would be very difficult to vertically deploy this antenna while flying in a straight line, particularly given the length of this antenna. Therefore, Takamo aircraft deploy these antennas at high altitude while the aircraft flies in a tight circle or orbit. The long wire antenna is weighted such that it hangs downwards and in practice this results in a roughly vertical polarization, that is an angle of 70 degrees or more. The short trailing wire is kept roughly horizontal by means of a small drag that keeps it from sagging more than approximately 20 degrees. Let's end with a brief summary. VLF stands for very low frequency and describes signals with a frequency in the range of 3 to 30 kilohertz although most practical VLF applications do not go below 10 kHz. VLF signals can propagate along the surface of the Earth or via SkyWave, in which signals are carried through a type of waveguide created by the Earth's surface and the lower layer of the Earth's ionosphere. Both modes provide very stable propagation, and the greatest sources of variation are spherics, or naturally occurring atmospheric noise, and diurnal effects, which occur at the day-night boundary. The very low frequencies at VLF require very large antennas. Fixed VLF transmit sites are usually several kilometers across, but even these are still electrically short antennas, so robust tuning or matching is also required. VLF is used in several applications, the most important of which is global communications. But keep in mind that VLF can only provide very low bandwidths or bit rates. VLF also has the advantage that it can be used for submarine communications, since VLF signals can be received through several dozen meters of salt water. And finally, we took a short look at TACAMO, which is a well-known example of a modern VLF communication system. This concludes our presentation, Understanding VLF. If you'd like to learn more about radio communications, propagation, 
or communications and test and measurement solutions from Rodi and Schwartz, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit us at rodi-schwartz.com.